All right, if you would open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll be finishing chapter 1 and entering into chapter 2 a little bit this morning. But 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 23 through chapter 4, verse 4. How much do you care? I know you're really, there needs to be more to that question. How much do I care about what? Right? It is a strange question, but how much do you care? And I would finish that question with, how much do you care about people? How much do you care about people, specifically believers? But we really can include really anyone and everyone in that, not just believers, but all people. But how much do you care? And I realize we all have our limits that we can care deeply for someone and then at a certain point just go, okay, but we're pushing this a little bit too far. But the way in which and, and, and the amount of which you care about people changes the way in which you interact with them, especially with believers, but everybody else as well. If you don't care about people very much, you'll probably wind up treating them actually pretty poorly. But if you really do care about people, it changes the way. You'll be uh, less guarded, more open, and, and, and trying to avoid maybe the disagreements or, or conflicts and things that are there that are so prone in our society, even in our churches at times. How much do you care about people? Paul will actually be demonstrating some of the lessons in how to deal with people, especially with people when they're at odds. You know, it's not that hard to get along with people when you're friends or maybe your spouse and you, you've gotten along and things are going well. And, but when you're at odds with someone and straining and struggling and there's a rift between the relationships that's, that are there, it's really hard to interact well with that person. And Paul, I think, is really going to give us three lessons this morning as he's dealing with a group of people that are obstinate and difficult. And he's going to give us three lessons that I think we can kind of emulate in our own lives. A lesson in diplomacy, a lesson in authority, and a lesson in joy. And so those are the three things I want to see, I think we can see this morning in our passage. So let's read that, 2 Corinthians 1, starting verse 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that, I, when, I, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. We start out first and foremost in this lesson in diplomacy. A lesson in diplomacy. Paul finds himself kind of in a sticky situation, as we have mentioned multiple times. But this church is at odds with him. They don't really particularly care for him or like him very much. And Paul knows this, and he comes in here in a very diplomatic manner. What do I mean by that? Well, diplomacy can have a couple definitions, but one I think that's very fitting here is exercising skill in handling affairs without arising, arousing hostility. Without arising, arousing hostility. Paul knows they're upset with him. For various reasons, they're upset with him. And I think it's easy to read this sometimes. And they're being petty. You didn't come and visit me. I mean, part of me is like, are we in junior high? You know, like, I mean, like, how old are we? Like, oh, you didn't visit me. But you know what? The reality is there are going to be situations in life where you're going to look at someone else and you're thinking, there's a rift, and you're like, you're being petty. There will be times when that's reversed. And you'll be upset and someone's looking at you and saying, you're being petty. You might not feel like you're being petty. And maybe it's not being petty, but they see it that way. Or maybe it's just a rift. Maybe it's just a difficult it's a situation. But regardless of those kinds of things, there will be times in which you still have to exercise the diplomacy or you will just, everybody's going to get angry. And I think just look, seeing that as petty one way or the other just adds a layer of difficulty to that. And so Paul's entering into the situation, figure out like, okay, how can I... How can I walk this back? How can we smooth things over? Not just like covering over, but how can we restore this relationship? And he really means that. He really does mean that. He wants to restore this relationship and deal with what is, has gotten them so upset. And so he's not just defending his apostleship, though he is. 
but he's also interacting with these people and trying to get them to calm down and move forward. It's not an easy task. And if you've been on the receiving end of a situation, whether it's petty or a real difficult situation, like honest to goodness difficult situation, you know how hard that can be sometimes. I mean, there can be a point in which you don't even want to get out of bed in the morning because you realize, I have to get up and I have to face this this morning. It's just like this, ugh, this weight. This weight that just kind of sits on your shoulders and just crushes you down. It's like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to face this. And a lot of times we can look at that and think, you know what, it's not worth it. It's really not worth facing. And thankfully, Paul gives us this great example. He says, no, I'm going to face this. And we need to, too. But that moves us from there to this finally getting a reason. Notice in verse 23 there, Paul actually starts to give us a bit of a, of, a, of a reason, but before he does so, he says, I call God to witness against me. Peter Naylor, in his commentary, actually said that Paul might have had the story of Ananias and Sapphira in mind here. If you remember that story, maybe you don't, but you go back to the book of Acts and you look at that story in that situation, and there it was that Ananias and Sapphira said they had a piece of property, you remember this, and they sold it off, and they took the money and thought, you know what? We're going to give it all to the church. We're going to give it all to God. And it wasn't true. They had held back a portion of that. But they were going to give it to the church because they wanted people to see them, and they wanted people to know, look, wow, look how spiritual. They just gave the whole thing. They wanted people to see that, and so they lied to the church. God was not deceived, and they were killed for it. So that's one thing. So, so lying to the church, not a good idea. And Paul is coming in and like, look, there, here's my reason for not coming to you. But what's important here to note is that he's making God his accomplice in this. See that? Like, if he's lying, he just made God his accomplice in this. That is not something you want to do. He's using it as evidence of proof. Right? You wouldn't do this if you're lying. You're not going to try to make God your accomplice in something. So he's actually using that as proof that he's telling the truth as he walks into this. But here's the reason. I did it to spare you. Like, that really is my reason. I did this to spare you. And we finally get some kind of a reason. It's not a huge reason. It's not a, a, a lot of explanation, but it is what he gives us. He didn't want to hurt him. He really didn't want to hurt him, so he stayed at a distance. And he wrote a severe letter instead. He still spoke truth. He still interacted with them, but he kept it a difference. And I think it's important here to understand, and he's going to get into it a little bit later too, but he's not lording it over them. He's not lording his position and his situation over him. And it's hard because at the moment, they really don't like him. They're upset with him. They're frustrated with him. And he's not really being this bull in a china closet that it would be so easy to do. I love that phrase. You've, I don't know if you've used that before or not, but I looked it up. It's like, where does that come from? Where, like, who, you know? And, and it probably actually is based on a true events. I use it plural, events. But back in 17th century London, it was not uncommon for people to, you know, the, the, the livestock and animals would come into London itself to the various markets. And you can imagine what happens when some of those animals will get loose. They just kind of wander off and they go where they, I mean, who's going to tell a bull no? Right? And then so he winds up probably in some of the various shops that were out there. Mythbusters, of all people, actually tried to you know, figure this out. Is that really a thing? What does a bull do in a, in a china shop, in a glass shop? Strangely enough, a bull is very nimble. And was, it was only disturbing what was absolutely necessary. It was, it was kind of unique to do that. You wouldn't, it did not go at all how anybody would have expected. And what's interesting here is that Paul is coming into this situation, this very fragile and delicate situation, and though he is big and powerful like that bull, he's also very deliberate and, and uh, graceful as he's tiptoeing his way in this, only disturbing what needs to be disturbed. It's kind of fascinating when you think about that. So in some ways, he is like a bull in a china closet, but in the sense that he's gracious and graceful, in dealing with these people. And I think the reality is, had he actually come in person, had he actually been there in the beginning, it would have negatively affected that situation and hurt this church, hurt the relationship that they had. Because what they were doing was still wrong. They did need to be corrected. They did need to be rebuked. He did so. I mean, you, you think about the situation that the Corinthians are. He's already had 1 Corinthians. He's got this severe letter, and now he's dealing with them again. This is, a, this is a troublemaking kind of a church, if you will. It's difficult, and yet he corrects them from a distance. And I think what's important to see here is that you can very much feel the heartbeat of Paul all throughout this passage that we've read. You really can feel the heartbeat because he's absolutely tortured here as he's writing to them. He's not enjoying this. There are some people, maybe you've come across them, they like confrontation, right? 
you've been around people that they just they jump on it. Oh, I get to challenge you. I'm all in. And you're like, oh, I hate people like this. Right. It's frustrating. It's hard. Some people love that. And I think because Paul is constantly writing to churches and correcting and giving doctrine, doing all this thing, we get the impression that's who Paul is. And I don't think he really is. I don't think he really is. He does what needs to be done, but I don't think this is Paul's forte. Paul loves this church. I wouldn't be surprised if they're reading this passage in this letter, maybe even specifically this passage, that there are not literally tear stains on the parchment and on the ink itself, maybe smearing that a little bit as he's writing to them and pleading with them. As you, as you look through the passage, you, you can see that. There's a, verse 4, I wrote to you out of affliction and anguish of heart and many tears not to cause you pain and that I have an abundant love for you. I mean, you see, that that's not someone who loves confrontation. That's someone who actually just loves them. And so Paul's using great diplomacy here. He's reasoning with them, pleading with them, not demanding. Mary Wollstonecraft, I think is how you say her name, but Mary Wollstonecraft was the mother of the author of Frankenstein. And she's the one that famously said, and you're probably familiar with this phrase, convince a man against his will, he's of the same opinion still. Classic phrase. And it's so true. And I think Paul is not trying to come in here and come in heavy-handed and convince the Corinthians of something against their will. He's pleading with them and reasoning with them. Because if you forget that, you really will create a monster. Paul exercised great diplomacy here. And I think we can see that all throughout this in this tense situation. But I think there's a couple other lessons that we can learn from here, too. And then we want to look at the, the second one here, too. A lesson of authority. A lesson uh, in authority. Actually, lessons in authority. Again, as we've already mentioned, not lording it over them. There's obviously going to be some overlap here between what we did, diplomacy and authority. But Paul really isn't lording it over him, over them the way that he could. I think it's interesting, as, as Paul even contemplates, should I bring this up, right? Should I deal with this, as he talks about? You know, like, I contemplated, uh, you know, I wanted to spare you. And that might have even rubbed them the wrong way, too. Oh, you're going to spare us, are you? Like, who are you? Remember, they're questioning his apostleship. They don't really like him. They have a problem in authority. He recognizes that. And he is. And even though he has this authority figure, and they have a huge problem with that, He's exercising restraint. He could probably have forced his way in there and done all kinds of things, but instead he treats them with respect, dignity, and care, and love, and he really does what's, want what's best for them. How do you deal with those you have authority and responsibility over? How do you deal with them? Because sometimes it could be something as simple and, and maybe as ordinary as kids. But it could be employees. It could even be parents that you're dealing with your parents and, and they're in a situation where they're no longer maybe capable of taking care of themselves anymore and you're having to deal with them. That Now the, the roles have switched. You're now the authority in their lives because of necessity, because you have to be. Coworkers, sometimes we have jobs that make us responsible for maybe a certain project or, or have authority over them. How do you deal with them? It can be kind of hard. Do you rule or try to rule with an iron fist, ranting and raving, and it's my way and this way and that and the other thing? Paul's coming here, and, and multiple times he mentions the word joy. I'm working for your joy. Now remember, he's an authority figure. He's an apostle. I'm working for your joy. I'm working for your, we could rephrase it, your benefit. That's what he's doing here. And they'll actually both mutually benefit. Paul wants joy for himself. We'll kind of talk about that later. But it's like, I want joy for me, but I want joy for you too. It's for their benefit. There are too many people that make life about themselves. They make their authority all about themselves. And like, how does this benefit me? How can I be helped? How can this help me in these areas? They're miserable people to work for. They're miserable people to be around. We don't like that. You know, I grew up as a, a Phillies fan. And, uh, you know, was, I think the one and only poster I ever had of any sports figure at all was a poster of Lenny Dykstra. He was one of the better players at that time. I don't, does it, you even heard of him? Oh, okay, a few people, oh, of course, Dean. But a few of you, right? He was probably one of the better, I don't think the best player ever. Uh, but I think he retired out in the 90s or the early 2000s or whatever. But when he retired, he, st he tried to start his own magazine and trying to get something, something rolling there. And he kind of forgot, like, you're not playing in the MLB anymore. You're not making millions of dollars anymore. You should 
probably think about how you're spending your money. And he didn't. So he's hiring all these people, trying to get this magazine off the ground. And you can imagine how expensive it is, because if you're doing a magazine, you can't just hire your neighbor to take your pictures and write your articles anymore. You know, you're paying people substantial amounts of money, flying all over the place and doing all these kinds of things. So he quickly started running out of money, but he liked what he was doing and trying to feed his habit. And, and he had this bad people, many, many people talked about they were working for him. And he was terrible because he would beg and plead to borrow money, even asking for your credit card number rack up debt on your credit card, and then never pay it. There was one particular guy who worked for him for 67 days. I don't know if that includes weekends or not, but he worked for 67 days. I don't think he ever got paid. And, he, and Lenny Dykstra put $32,000 on his credit card. He's probably one of the few guys in history that ever took a job and lost money, like the entire time. It, it, it's a terrible thing. And, and, and Lenny just seemed to be tone deaf to anybody and everybody, because he did it to everybody. He was a boss who did not care. He had authority. He was the boss. He did not care about you. It was a terrible employer, a terrible guy, right? Thankfully, that's not the Apostle Paul, but there are people that exercise their authority like that. It's all about me. And Paul's looking at them and saying, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about God. I want this. I'm here for you. I'm here for your joy. We both can mutually benefit here. And he's using his authority in that way appropriately. It's hard to do. It's hard to level the playing field. It's hard to look across and say, I want, I want us to win together. I want us to do this together. But that's really what the Apostle Paul is doing. So it's one aspect of authority, not lording it over them. Paul didn't do that, but many people do. Another one is something I just call friendly fire. Doug Wilson is an author and pastor, and he said this, when the parent is qualified to discipline, he probably doesn't feel like it, and when he feels like it, he's probably not qualified. What he means by that is this, that when our kids, in, in this particular case, when they act up and you really want to discipline them, in those moments, you're probably not qualified. You're probably angry. You're really frustrated. You're not going to discipline them well. On the flip side, there are times when you're kind of like, you're probably a lot more understanding. Well, I get it. These sort of circumstances, these things are happening. You're in a much better mindset. You might not want to, but you're much more in that moment qualified to discipline your children, exercising your authority appropriately. And I think that principle holds true in a lot of situations and moments, not just parenting. I think Paul wanted to come, but was probably recognizing in himself, I'm not qualified to come to you. Now, we don't know that for sure, but I'm looking at this, and he wrote a severe letter to them. He's upset with them. I think he looked and said, you know what? If I come there, it's not going to go well. I'm not qualified. Somebody still needs to do something. Somebody still needs to say something. But if I come there, it's not going to be pretty. So he writes instead, I did it to spare you. I think he recognized that. He doesn't want to provoke them to wrath. Otherwise, it was just going to be a, it was going to be a tense visit. He says, you know what? I'm taking a distance from here. All right? He wrote instead. But, but he's still speaking up. And he's still, t still taking that authority role seriously. And I think that applies in other situations as well. I was listening to a, uh, someone named Eric Schumacher. I think he's kind of, a, kind of a nobody, honestly. But he was given this story about when he was back in college, and this is many years ago, and he had gotten back late from a date. And he gets back to the room, the dorm room. It's kind of early in his college career here. And, he, and, he, and his roommate goes over and asks him, he's like, man, where have you been? Oh, I was on a date. For that long? You left at like 4 o'clock. He goes, oh, no, it was my second date today. And he's like, second date? Why? And he's like, what? And he goes, no, 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 well, okay, you have to understand, I had three dates today. I had a lunch date, I had a dinner date, and I had a dessert date. And I'm just getting back now. And he's looking at his roommate, and he's thinking, he's probably impressed. Like, I can, you know, go out with three different girls in the same day and, you know, be everything, you know, keep it all straight, and nobody gets upset with me or whatever. And his roommate, instead of being impressed, calls him out and says, what's the matter with you? And of course he was like, what do you mean, what's the matter with me? He doesn't get it at all. Why are you so upset? He goes, he rightly saw, his friend rightly saw, you're not interested in any of these girls. You're not really interested in, in any of them people. You're not looking for a long-term relationship. You're not really even looking for love. You're looking for something else and you're not finding it. And you keep going out with these people. You're hurting people. And he's talking about this. It reminded me of this verse here in Proverbs. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses 
of an enemy. And those two guys had actually been friends for a very long time. They'd known each other since at least junior high. And his roommate proceeded to tell, challenge Eric. He says, look, and he started listing out all the girlfriends, all the girls he had gone out with from the time he was like 13 until then. And he didn't go into a number, but it sounded like it was a long list. He says, something's wrong with you. You're lost. You're looking for something. And, and you're not finding it. And he called him out. He cared enough to call him out. See, we might not think of friends as having authority in our lives, but I think very clearly in Scripture, there's, a, there's an aspect in which they do. They have an authority. They have an authority and a right to speak into our lives. They have an authority and a right to wound us because they see things in ways that sometimes nobody else sees and they can speak and they can challenge and confront us. And we don't like that, but there's an element of which they're exercising a level of authority into our lives, and they should, and they have a responsibility to do that. They have a responsibility to do that to you, to wound you, but you also have a responsibility to wound others that are around you. Like, hey, what? Think about this. Ask questions. Challenge each other. That's what we're supposed to do as a community here. And I think this fits here really well because as Paul is addressing these people, he's treating them sometimes like children, but he's also treating them sometimes like friends. And as an authority figure and as a friend, he's asking them, the Corinthians, like, what's wrong with you? I think it would be so much easier for Paul to have just walked away from the whole situation. Look at these Corinthians like, you know what? Ugh, I need an Advil. Why, why do I have to deal with you? Like, you guys are like the most troublesome, problematic church I've ever seen in my life. I could just easily just write you off. I mean, it's not like the rest of the world doesn't need churches, right? I can go anywhere else, and they'll welcome me in, and we can get something started, and I'll just like, you just do your own thing. I'm tired of this. He can go anywhere. And he keeps going back to this church, and it seems like this is the most problematic church because he's writing them, what? The first letter, then we have the missing letter, and we have this one. He's constantly doing it. I think he wrote more and dealt more with the Corinthian church than he wrote to anybody else. And the whole, and you read 1 Corinthians and then really 2 Corinthians, it's nothing but problems. I mean, there's some doctrine sprinkled in there, but it's problems. He's always fixing their problems. It would have been easy to write it off and say, I'm done. But friends don't give up on us, do they? They come in and they speak truth and they do really what's best for them. And he does that. He really is in their corner. He really does care for them and love them. And even though he has authority as an apostle to speak truth, he doesn't necessarily pull out the apostle card. He comes in almost like a parent and almost like a friend card. He says, hey, look, let's work through this to do what's best for them. I don't know if that sounds like your boss or not, if you've worked for somebody like that or an authority figure like that to come in and visit with them and challenge them. Paul really does love them because he wants them to be the best version of themselves in Christ. And they're not. But they could be. So he challenges them. So we have a couple lessons there, I think, really from authority. But we can move there from there to one about joy. A lesson in joy. You know, it's not wrong to want to be happy think we as Christians sometimes think that's true, and, and I'm going to use happy and joy almost interchangeably because it's just going to happen. I know people sometimes put a dichotomy, and I agree with the dichotomy, but sometimes they're just kind of sort of interchangeable too. But people want to be happy. They want to have joy, real, meaningful joy. Paul wants that, but he wants the Corinthians to have it too. In fact, his joy is tied up with theirs, which is an interesting thing to think about. I think it's easy to think, if I'm happy, then you're not. Like, I've stolen it. Or, if you're happy, you've stolen mine. That's not how it works. Paul says, look, we should be able to ha be happy and speak into each other's lives, and both of us, the, the, the joy rate increases for both of us. It's not, it's not a, there's only a, a limited number, amount of joy in the world, and if you have it, then I can't. It's, it's something that's mutual. It can grow together and increase. It's a beautiful thing. He understands it. They're linked together, and he wants them to find their joy in God like he is. And the reality is that we all recognize this at some level. We all want to be happy. We all want to have this joy. 
And we're going to find it in something. People will find it all the time. Like they, they find it in things that they do. I love what I do. I find joy in my work, right? I find joy in maybe things that I collect or have. People collect all kinds of things. They're looking for joy, whether it's baseball cards or stamps or coins. I think the Turners collect grandkids. I mean, it's just they're looking for things to find joy, right? They want that. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. Marie Kondo was famous. I don't know if she's kind of fallen out of maybe popularity in the moment, but you know, she was like one of those things, you're cleaning out your house and you're looking at every object in your house and like, does this bring joy to me? And if the answer is no, then throw it out. Does this bring, interesting word, joy to me? Does it bring joy to me or is it just something I have? We want to be happy. We want joy, real, meaningful joy. They want to find that somewhere. And a quote we used a couple weeks ago from, from uh, Jim Carrey, it was so uh, appropriate, and, and it and applies here again, is it was something like he was, he was looking for joy, he was looking for happiness in his life, and he couldn't find it. And I think Jim, I don't know how much he's worth, I didn't look up his net worth or whatever, but I'm sure he's worth millions and millions of dollars. He's not looking for more money. He had two of those awards. I forget what, which Emmys or Grammys or whatever it was. He had two of those already. He's looking for a third one, thinking maybe, just maybe, that will make me happy. That will bring me joy. And even the way he delivers his monologue, you kind of wonder, like, if he's not in the back of his mind thinking, I don't think it will, but I still want it. I want to try. Because I don't know what else to do. But he's looking for something. He wants to be happy. If he could just get another accomplishment, maybe he'd be known for having that accomplishment, having three of these things, maybe he would have joy. Maybe it reminded me of Ecclesiastes 6. A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. I think that describes Jim Carrey and a whole host of other people really, really well. Wealth, possessions, honor. He has them all. He has tons of money. He has honor. He's got, I don't know if he's got one of those, what do they call the stars on the sidewalk somewhere. I would imagine he's got that. He's got awards on his shelf. He has all those things. He's got notoriety. He has everything a person could think. And what does the Bible say? If God withholds the ability to enjoy those things, he's not enjoying them. He has them. He's not enjoying them. And you contrast that with somebody else. Like the Apostle Paul, for instance, in Acts chapter 16, when he's locked in jail. And when they had inflicted many blows, this is talking about the crowd, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What a contrast! I don't know how much what Paul's net worth was at this moment in time, but I would guess that regardless, whatever possessions he maybe had on him were now in the soldiers' pockets or the crowd's pockets somewhere else. Remember, he's, he, he should have honor. He's a Roman citizen. You can't just beat a guy up and throw him in prison and walk away. He's a Roman citizen. He's, in, he's entitled to a, a trial. He's entitled to certain uh, uh, procedures, and those have been taken from him. They've been stripped from him. All those things are gone, and he's sitting in prison. And what does he do? He and Silas, together in the dark, and their feet in the stocks, are doing what? They sing. They sing. They have joy and suffering. Jim Carrey has, has, has nothing in, in abundance and success. Why? Because Paul's joy is not found in what he has, but who he has. He has God. He has a relationship with God. And so he sings because his joy and his happiness is not tied to a big pile of stuff. It's not tied to a big pile of accomplishment. It's tied to God. Now, there's an element in which we instinctively know this on a, on a lower level. Right? Because we get joy from people all the time. We can get joy from relationships all the time. Some of the most meaningful uh, things that we have in life are people. The relationships we have maybe with our kids or our siblings or our friends or our spouses or whoever it happens to be, they can bring me many meaningful relationships to us. They do. It is one of these simple pleasures and joys in life. Don't get me wrong. We can fight like cats and dogs. I realize that. And yet... It is one of the greatest sources of joy in life. 
What's the big problem then? It can be lost. It can be taken from us. Right? And people will go to great lengths sometimes to preserve those things. It's one of the few things in life that people are willing to lay down their lives for, to preserve a relationship or to preserve someone that they care dearly for. I will lay my life down for you. I will do this for you. But the relationship that we have in Christ is never lost. Even death cannot separate us from the love of God. Amen? It doesn't separate us. It's something that's enduring and permanent. It's, it's a joy. It brings joy because like I can't lose this. And it never tarnishes. It never fades. It never breaks. It's never lost. It can't be stolen. I get Jesus. That is the greatest source of joy a person could possibly have. And in fact, it's what Jesus did for us. Jesus comes and he endures the cross so that we can share the joy of relationship with him. Hebrews 12:2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the kind of relationship that we should have with God. One that is made up of and brings joy. It brings satisfaction. And his source of joy, Jesus' source of joy, really was God. There was something he was looking at and saying, you know what, I want that. And I want that more than my life itself. And he's willing to go to the cross for it. What does he want? It says, Who, for the joy that was set before him. What's being set before him? As you read the larger passage, you start thinking through this. The only thing that really makes sense is God. He wants God. And the, the end of the passage right there, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what he wants, that position of honor. He wants the relationship he can have with his Father. That's the joy. That's the real source of joy. That's what we should want. Jesus was willing to die for it so that we could share it too. See, it wasn't just for him. It was for us to bring us close because that kind of relationship is always found in God. True joy is always going to be found in God. We're always looking for joy. That's one of the things that Folgers really got right. You know I'm going to dunk on Folgers. You just know it. Just wait for it. Folgers, right? Do you remember that, co that commercial from the 90s? The best part of waking up? So they say. It's amazing. And that commercial is pure brilliance and gold. Don't get me wrong. You know, you do that. And what do they know? They know it's a motivation. It's a joy. You want to wake up and you're like, oh, I got to face another day. But wafting through the air is what? The smell of being fresh brewed coffee. Like, oh, well, if I got to get up, at least I can have something hot and warm in my cup very quickly and just get going for the day, right? It's a joy, or they want it to be at least. You know, already know it's not going to be Folgers in my cup. Just saying. But honestly, there's nothing you can put in that cup that's going to change that. That you can put in that. Because anything you put in that cup is not going to leave you satisfied. And people try to put all kinds of things in that cup. Not just coffee. Fame. Money. People. All kinds of things. They're constantly putting things in that cup. Make me happy. Bring me joy. And it can't. Because no matter what you put in that cup, eventually it will cool and it will turn bitty, bitter and you'll be looking and like, okay, I need to replace this. I'm dumping this out. I need something else. Only Jesus can fill that cup and fill it up and you're like, I have it. I finally have something that will bring me joy. Indestructible joy. Paul wants that so desperately for the Corinthians. He wants that really for us. We should feel the same way too. Lord, fill my cup. Let my satisfaction and my joy come for you. It's what makes it worth getting out of the bed in the morning. When we smell the aroma of Jesus walking through the air, it's like, yes, Lord, that is my joy. That is my satisfaction. Because nothing else, nothing else satisfies. Because it can't. Our three lessons this morning... They're not for the faint of heart. They're actually really hard. You really can't en enact any of them yourself. You can try. People try all the time. They're determined. They're, they're, they're looking at this and thinking, I can do this. I can make this happen. They're truly otherworldly, though. You realize that. They really are truly otherworldly. 
to really do these, I, th I think you have to go back to one of the things that Jesus talked about when he talked about the, the, the second greatest commandment. If you want to have, uh, the only way to really have and use diplomacy in the lives of other people around you is to truly love your neighbor as yourself. To truly value that other person. To truly love that other person. That's the only way that works. If you want to have authority in a person's life to speak that, whether it's in a friendship form or as, a, as, a, as, as someone that's literally over someone else, and you want to do that well, you want to do that like Paul, the only way you can really do that is to look at people and love them as, as yourself. Right? The only way to really come into this and to truly have joy and want people around you to also have joy, the only way to do that, really, is to love your neighbor like yourself. Because otherwise, you're always going to fall short. And the Apostle Paul would be the first one to tell you, like, this isn't coming from inside of me. This is something that God did in me, in my life. He changed me. He's working in Paul. And Paul's not perfect, and neither are we. That God is working in our lives, making us see these things, and truly, like, how can I care for people? How can I truly love them? You've got to love them like yourself. That will change the way that you exercise authority and diplomacy, and joy. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for the challenge that Paul was issuing forward to these Corinthians, really to all of us. And Lord, as he is dealing with a very difficult situation in the lives of these people, Lord, there's a lot of things that we can see, the way in which he dealt with them. It's not the way that we often deal with other people around us we often fall woefully short of what Paul was modeling for each and every one of us. And the reason Paul could model that was because he was modeled after you. Lord, you were taking Paul and molding him and making him into what he needed to be. His job was not easy. And yet, Lord, because you were speaking into his life, challenging him and working on him. It transformed the way he was able to interact with these uh, Corinthians, a very difficult group. Lord, I pray you would do that with us. Help us to be so affected by your word that it, we can't help but for it to come out. That we truly become people of your word and that it affects every area of our lives, especially the difficult ones. The ones that are, that are offering up many times for us like a power trip that I get to have and, and, and use and utilize power over people, Lord. We can become drunk on that desire for power and authority, Lord, and use it terribly with malice and evil. And Paul doesn't. He really is very diplomatic in the way in which he approached the Corinthians. He was very much willing to be authoritative, but more along the lines of a friend, or maybe even a parent, than a dictator. And Lord, even the joy. Lord, it wasn't just for his joy. He wanted them to share in that. And Lord, as fallen human beings, it's really hard to share. And yet, even though this group of people, in which they were in the moment not seeing eye to eye, he was doing things that they would benefit from. Please, Lord, do that great work in us. We've seen an example. Please, Lord, make it a reality that we might truly be people of the word, that people would see a difference in our hearts and lives. and exercise the responsibilities you've given to us well. I pray these things in Christ's name.